The state Supreme Judicial Court recently drew a sharp line between police authority and racial profiling. At issue was an arrest in Roxbury for illegal gun possession the court says was based on profiling and a hunch instead of probable cause. The person arrested was running away from police, but the court said running away isn't always grounds for suspicion. The decision was hailed by civil rights attorneys, and we'd like to welcome one of them, a staff attorney for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. Sophia Hall, uh, thank you very much for being with us, Sophia. Thank you, Chris. First of all, talk about what's so unusual about this court decision, because I think the thing that got everybody's attention was the reference to racial profiling and what that might mean in the, the minds of the average person in, in parts, of, uh, parts of Boston. Yeah, we at the Lawyers Committee really applaud this decision because it's our opportunity to see what we're talking about play out in the media, you know, across the country what we see every day when we get intake calls from people in the community um, reflected back through a legal decision. As I sort of mentioned earlier is that not everyone's experience with officer friendly is the same. You know, there is a rampant existence of racial profiling in this country, in Boston and through other communities. And it's significant for the court to take into consideration that that affects the relationships between communities of color and police officers. No, I mean, I, I, have to admit, you know, I, I grew up in Boston and when I was younger and, and tougher looking, uh, <laughs> I got stopped and asked questions by police sometimes. I, I didn't enjoy it, but on the other hand, I, I wasn't afraid something bad was going to happen to me. I guess that means it's different for me than it is for some other people. Well, I think it's different for communities of color at a time in which what we're seeing even just this week are the deaths of, again, two black men when interacting with the police and initiations that had nothing to do with those individuals. A car stopped on the side of the road looking for another suspect. I mean, it is dangerous sometimes for communities of color, for black men to interact with the police. And we're seeing that play out. So the reaction that perhaps I should be trepidatious, perhaps I should be cautious when I engage with a police officer is a valid one. We're talking with Sophia Hall from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, now, in, in this case, the court was also uh, trying to lay down the line on, on what are grounds for making an arrest. Now, this was a police uh, action that was more or less in response to a report of a robbery and, and an officer sees somebody, um, first, first of all, um, uh, just acting on a description of suspects. I, um, I guess the descriptions really didn't match up here, and there wasn't much of a description to begin with. Honestly, in this case, the description was extremely vague based on dark colored clothing. Um, but I think what this draws to attention to is this idea of what is sufficient reasonable suspicion. And even though they're supposed to take in the totality of the circumstances, it really shouldn't be a hunch. It really shouldn't be based upon some sort of implicit bias that you see a black man walking down the street in a particular area and, hey, perhaps he's a suspect. And I think this is really relevant because we just filed a complaint this week on Monday against the Walpole Police Department for racially profiling a black man for a similar instance in which normal Saturday afternoon running his errands left and he found himself followed, stopped, removed from his car, frisked and searched illegally. And we really do believe based upon everything, the totality of the circumstances there, that it was solely because he was a black man. And that was a case that there's nothing specified about the way he was driving his car or anything like that. You know, no broken tail light or anything. Yeah. Correct. There was no traffic violation. There were no late or expired plates, no broken tail light. They simply followed him for approximately 15 minutes and pulled him over. He responded appropriately. He gave all the documentation. He did everything right, which is what we keep hearing across the country. But unfortunately, he was still removed from his car, searched, frisked. Um, and that's part of the larger problem that we're seeing through Boston, through Massachusetts, and across the country. Now, of course, on the other hand, a decision like this, uh, uh, the court mentioned about what happened in Roxbury, was that uh, you know police can arrest people running away, but you, you need one more dot at least to, to connect before you say, well, that per person is suspicious enough, I must go out and try to arrest them. Exactly. I think what the judge brought to light here is that running away doesn't have to be an indication of guilt. It can also be a, a flight from an indignity that black men are experiencing in the community when dealing with police officers. I mean, I think it's just another example of the tension that exists when it, we talk about communities of color and police officers 
And you know, what we've said time and time again is that all police departments, in particular Boston, need to implement some kind of comprehensive implicit bias training. They need to diversify their police ranks so that those tensions no longer exist, so that people don't flee from the behaviors or the interactions with the police departments. What about the reaction of police officials? Because you know, they say that you know, they really don't think this was the right call by the Supreme Court, and the DA's office wants it to be reheard. And you know, they're saying, look, we, how are we gonna get guns off the streets if decisions like this come at us? I mean, unfortunately, the reality is that the Boston Police Department and police departments across the country don't see this issue the same way as the community does. That does not negate the fact that time and time again, just like this week, we are seeing again killings, shootings. Um, we're seeing problems with communities of color. It, despite what the police department is saying, there is a need, there's a clear need for diversification and for some sort of implicit bias training because the implicit bias really does come into play when they're engaging with communities of color. Of course, the other thing here uh, about uh, the, the way you judge what you see in the street, uh, this was in December uh, and we're talking about black men in hoods. <laughs> I've, I've walked around Roxbury wearing a hood in December myself, so I mean, I, mean, I mean, that's not a very reliable thing to go by, I guess. No, and I think that's just one more indication of why we really need appropriate training for police officers. Again, you know, bias affects all of us for various reasons, but when we talk about community policing, we want people in the public to feel safe, and in order to do that, officers need to be able to identify their own bias and overcome it so that they're not making the wrong decisions uh, that we're seeing across the country. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Sophia Hall from Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice.